where we left off in the last video in 1924. Hitler was in jail. His coup d'etat in 1923, his famous beer hall putsch in Munich had failed. He's now in jail. He's writing Mein Kampf. When he gets out of jail, so this is when he's in jail, the Nazi party is banned. And a lot of the economic tor turmoil that made the possibility of overthrowing the government more likely, as that we saw in the early 20s, that hyperinflation in Weimar Germany, this was now under control by the time Hitler comes out of jail. They had issued new currency. It was far more stable. So to a certain degree, they were the, the Nazis and Hitler were starting from scratch. Although even at this point, Hitler continues to be an ever-growing influence. He's a famous speaker. There are more and more people who are knowing about him and who are following him. Over the next few years, his book does get published, and it's, it sells actually tens of thousands of copies over the next several years. But for the most part, he's still a relatively small actor in German politics. But then we fast forward as we get to the late 20s. The Nazis are gaining some influence, but then in 1929, in 1929, you have a global change for for the economy of the world, and that's the beginning of the Great Depression. In particular, what's often kind of the the first sign that the Great Depression was at hand is you have the U.S. stock market crashes in October of 1929, famous Black Tuesday. And that was the mark of the beginning of a not just an American depression, but a global depression. So bring you have the whole world going into a depression. And then anytime you have economic turmoil, it tends to give more energy to the more extreme parties, whether it's the, the parties like the Nazis, who one could consider maybe to be on the extreme right or often considered to be on the extreme right or very or maybe you could say very nationalistic or even the extreme left parties who are obviously uh, against capitalist systems and, and, and whatever else. And so by the election of 1930, and now we're talking about parliamentary elections and the parliament in Germany is the Reichstag, the Reich, Reichstag, and I know I'm mispronouncing it. In the Reichstag elections, the Nazi party for the first time is able to have a significant showing. It gets 18, it gets roughly 18% of the vote and a proportional representation in the parliament. So now all of a sudden, this kind of marks the beginning of the Nazis being significant, significant players in German politics. Then we get to 1932, and the economy is not improving. It's only getting worse. 1932. Adolf Hitler actually makes a run for president. The current president at that point is Paul von Hindenburg, famous for the Hindenburg line, later for the Hindenburg, the Zeppelin, the famous exploding Zeppelin disaster. And he was, with Ludendorff, one of the two leaders of the German military effort during World War I. He's president of the Weimar Republic since 1925. And in 1932, he is able to get re-election, but Hitler has a, has a fairly good showing. Hitler is able to get 35% of the vote. Hitler gets 35% of the presidential election votes of the vote. And the Weimar Republic had this strange system it wasn't quite a presidential system like the U.S., and it wasn't quite a pure parliamentary system like the current day Germany. The president was independently elected and had some powers, and then the parliament was also independently elected, and then they would try to build coalitions to have a ruling government. But needless to say, 1932, Hitler is now a major actor. The Nazis also have a, a many, many, many seats in, in parliament. Now, you have several parliamentary elections as well in 1932, and as we just talked about, two in particular, in order for a government to form in parliament, in order to find the cabinet and the chancellor, who's essentially the prime minister, you have an election and the different parties get different amounts of votes. And if no party has a majority, the parties have to form a coalition that can make a majority. And so there's a lot of horse trading going on with parties negotiating, hey, why don't we form a coalition with each other if we do that? Maybe someone from my party can be Minister of the Interior, some of your, someone of, of your party could be uh, uh, the Chancellor, and maybe we can get a coalition together to rule over the government. But you have two parliamentary elections and no majority coalition forms. So two, two elections, so this is parliamentary, so this is in the presidential election. Hindenburg is still president, but Hitler has a good showing. And then you have two parliamentary elections, parliament elections or Reichstag elections, where you have no majority, no coalition, no majority, majority 
coalition. And the Nazis continue to be a major actor here. They continue to get, uh, 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 have more and more of a showing inside the Reichstag. So then by 1933, it's a bit of a crisis. So as we get into early 1933, we have a little bit of a crisis. We have no government. We have uh, 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 no chancellor. We have no cabinet to essentially be the executive, the government to, to, of, of the country because there has been no major coalition. And the Weimar Constitution allowed a strange thing. It allowed the president to appoint a government, appoint a cabinet, a chancellor that might not even be representative of what's going on in parliament. And so Paul von Hindenburg is convinced that, hey, look, and he was no fan. There's, you know, he was no fan of Adolf Hitler. But he's convinced that, look, Adolf Hitler was your opponent. If you make Adolf Hitler the head of an interim government, the head of an interim cabinet, then that might be a way to create some national unity. And, and then maybe we could have some parliamentary elections that there can be a majority coalition and you could have, I guess you could say, a more legitimate government take hold. And so Paul von Hindenburg is convinced. And so he does, even though, even though the Nazis are still a minority party, even though they, they weren't part of any type of a majority coalition, Paul von Hindenburg, who's not a fan of Adolf Hitler, appoints him as chancellor. So this is in January. So in January, Hitler, Hitler is appointed chancellor, chancellor, which is essentially the prime minister of the Reichstag of the of of Germany, and then we get to February, and events get really, really, really interesting. So in February of 1933. You have a fire in the Reichstag building in Berlin. So this is the Reichstag building right over here, and it is on fire. And they find this gentleman here on the scene, Marinus van der Lubbe. He's a Dutch communist. It is essentially the blame is placed as this was some type of a, the beginning of some type of a communist revolution. And this is used as a pretext. Hitler then advises Paul von Hindenburg to essentially use some of his emergency powers as president, to, which is another strange thing that the Weimar Constitution allowed for. It allowed the, the president, under emergency conditions, to start to suspend civil rights. This was an emergency situation. And so you, Paul von Hindenburg does that. So he essentially issues, and you, so once you have, the, you have the Reichstag fire, Reichstag fire, and then Hindenburg is convinced by the Nazis to, the, to pass the Reichstag, the Reichstag fire decree, fire decree, which essentially suspends, it gives the government emergency powers and it suspends civil liberties, which everything up to this point now is actually legal. This was actually allowed for in the Weimar Constitution, suspends, suspends civil, civil liberties. And since there's no coalition, the whole point that, that Hitler's cabinet was going to be an interim one, you have another, you have another parliamentary election coming in March with, 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 the, with the hope of maybe a majority coalition forms. But that March election, especially with civil liberties suspended, you could imagine that the Nazis and they have their 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 kind of their store their their paramilitary troopers started intimidating other parties, making sure that uh, they had a better showing at the polls. They started in intimidating other candidates. The March elections start to swing hugely in the Nazis' favor. So in the March election, they're able to get 44 percent of the vote, which is still not enough by themselves to form a government. It's still not a majority, but they're able now, this is a, they're, they're now the largest party in the Reichstag, in the parliament. They're able to now form a majority coalition. And I guess you could say more legitimately, although this was a election of intimidation, they were able to now, they're able to now form a government. They're able to now form a government based on a majority coalition and Hitler remains chancellor. But then, this new parliament passes the Enabling Act in March. Enabling Act. Enabling Act, which is essentially an amendment to the Weimar Constitution, which gives the cabinet, especially the chancellor, effectively the chancellor, who's the head of the cabinet, legislative powers, unlimited legislative powers for the next four years. So it gives, it gives legislative powers. And remember, we already have suspended civil rights so the Reichstag is essentially giving over the legislative powers, legislative powers to, to the chancellor, who happens to be 
who happens to be Hitler. And there was some check on this by the president, but then we have Hindenburg dying the next year. But after this, after the suspension of civil rights and then the Enabling Act shortly afterwards, Hitler is essentially in full control. Hitler and the Nazis are essentially in full control of the German government. And at this point, Hitler is the dictator, the dictator of he is the dictator of Germany. And they start to act fast. They start to intimidate other parties. They, they use violence. They start to imprison people. And by July of 1933, so they're acting very, very fast. By July of 1933, Nazis are the only legal party. Only legal pop party. And they essentially have full control. Now, this is how Hitler came to power. And the question that's probably circling in your mind is, who did this fire? This fire was the catalyst, although Hitler was already chancellor and maybe he would have found some way to get to power regardless. But this fire, even though there was evidence that looked like maybe Marinus van der Lubbe did it, uh, it was blamed on the communists. It was the pretext that was used to give the, the government even more power, especially the, the Nazis even more power. This is an open question, one of those great open questions, one of those great open questions of history. Some people feel that maybe it was just a, a, a communist plot. Maybe it was Marinus van der Lubbe acting on his own and, and maybe it just happened to fall into the hands of Hitler and they were able to use it, while other historians think that this was actually a plot by the Nazis to, to kind of create this emergency state. And Marinus van der Lubbe was just kind of a puppet in this, in this whole plot. So open question of history, but needless to say, as we go from 1919 to 1933, Hitler goes from a fairly unknown individual to full dictator of Germany.